I'm Phil Hebner, and I'm the campus pastor at Wisconsin Lutheran High School. Hello, I'm C.L. Whitesot, and I serve as an assistant principal. This is the third in a series of four videos that we're shooting at Wisconsin Lutheran High School uh, called A Conversation About Race. We filmed two videos with our students, and now we're taking a little different angle, maybe one that isn't presented so often right now with all the discussions going on, and that's the viewpoint of adult males and men and fathers. And so we're going to take some time to talk about the issues that are going on, and we'll see where the conversation goes. The point is to not only listen and to learn from one another and, and just to show love to each other, but also perhaps to be an opportunity for those out there in the world to listen and to learn and to see what an example of loving Christian conversation is like. Uh, so with that, let's get started with the guys introducing themselves. Here is our esteemed panel. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Sean Spruer. Uh, first, I just want to say I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I am born and raised from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, graduated uh, as an alum of Wisconsin Lutheran High School. Um, currently, uh, I am one of the administrators at Kingdom Prep Lutheran High School. I'm Aaron Robinson, pastor at Fairview Lutheran Church. I grew up in Milwaukee as well, born and raised, went to St. Marcus Lutheran School on the east side of Milwaukee, go Mustangs, and I served as campus pastor here for a number of years at Wisco. My name is Corey Tipton, and I'm uh, blessed to be here as well with this, on this panel with all these gentlemen. Um, I work for the city of Milwaukee, and I currently serve as one of the board of directors here at Wisconsin Lutheran High School, and I have two uh, young men that are in attendance here. Kurt. My name is Aaron Bauer. I'm a teacher and a coach at Guard Home Lutheran School here in Milwaukee. This will be my 18th year serving uh, here. I've also had the opportunity to coach some of the junior Vikings here at Wisco. I have two children that will be in attendance, a sophomore and a freshman here at Wisco. Hello, I'm Andy Gady, a graduate of Wisconsin Lutheran High School in 1987. I've had four kids graduate from here in, in 13, um, what well, would be uh, 13, 14, 17, and 18. Um, I had the pleasure to serve also on the board here, and thanks for um, asking me to join the panel tonight. My name is Chuck A. Fletcher. Uh, I'm a graduate of Wisconsin Lutheran High School in 2008. I'm currently serving uh, as site director at Lighthouse Youth Center. And it's amazing to be here with the with the group of men, a little bit older than my. I'm not dating anybody, <laughs> but uh, a bunch of men who I respect and uh, look up to for everything that they've done for the people of Milwaukee. So thank you. Okay, with everything that's been going on, the different pro protests, the different riots, uh, George Floyd's death has ignited a lot of different things. How have you been doing it? How have you been feeling it? You're coping with everything? It, it, it's been keeping me busier. Good. It's been keeping me busy. I've been busier than, than before with this topic. Uh, I've got a 19-year-old daughter who's in college, and she's trying to work through where she's at in this. So uh, that's been those have been good conversations to have around the table. Uh, I, I serve a congregation that's primarily uh, white in its makeup, and so it's been good conversations with my members and helping them get through some of the angst and some of the struggle. But um, personally. It's been, it feels like this. I'll just share this feeling. It feels like there's been a book written of about 400 pages, and we haven't read the same book, White American, Black America. And so now this moment happens, and there's this climax that we see differently. And so it's just kind of interesting because I've been thinking about race my whole life as I, I was brought up by my mom and my dad to consider it in things. And it's just now hitting my, my white friends and, and brothers in Christ, that they're now asking the same questions that I may have asked when I was a teenager. I'd say, uh, for me, it's been like a, a roller coaster. You know, when you first saw the, the incident take place with George Floyd in, in Minnesota, you're like, no, this, this can't be happening. What's, what's going on here? Why would, why would anybody do that to another human being? Regardless of color or yeah. anything like that, why would you do that to another human being? And then the protest started, and they, they seemed like they had some validity to them. And, and I just tried to explain it to my children, like, okay, this is this is why this is going on to get the conversation going. And now I'm at a point, you know, from from first it was amazed, then it was, huh, and now I'm at a point of disappointment. And the disappointment comes in where 
the conversations are, I, I appreciate that we're having this conversation, but we're not fully having the conversation everywhere. Um, like, where do you think we're not having the conversation? Like, what do you mean by everywhere? Well, so for me personally, I can't speak for the other guys on the, on the panel here, but for me personally, those people in my life that say they're friends, cohorts, they don't know how to start that conversation with me. And that, that brings that disappointment, that brings that, like, uh, that weirdness in my stomach. Like, all you have to do is just say, how you doing? Well, we start a conversation. Mm -hmm. We sat around campfires together, <laughs> gone golfing together. <laughs> we, you know, I've been to your kids' weddings, graduations, but now you don't know what to say to Corey. That's, that hurts. So hearing Corey talk, as white men, you hear him say that he's had uh, his white counterparts or white friends have awkward moments. Have you had any awkward moments or moments where you don't necessarily feel comfortable asking a, a black person something? After listening to Corey speak about the little awkward conversations, uh, it kind of hit me because I'm an usher at our church, and it's nice that we got an opportunity to go back to worship. Um, and for years, all of uh, African American uh, men and, and women have treated me like family, and I'd say I had a really hard time the first time, well, because of COVID, we couldn't do any of the hugging, but knowing what to say, because right now it feels like I'm the bad guy in the situation. And I, the silence isn't, I don't love you. The silence is, isn't, I don't care about you. The silence is, I'm so appalled at what happened. I just don't know how to communicate that with you. Um, so for a white male to have an African American say to me, hey, why haven't you reached out? It's like, man, I gotta do a better job but the conversation is tough to start. And so if anybody has any expert, you know, yeah, wisdom on how to start those tough conversations, I'd love to hear. I guess from my point of view, um, I haven't had those situations come up as of yet, you know, a rough situation and have that type of discussion. But where the frustration comes in is, is seeing how it's, been politicized and, and the media has driven such a narrative that's away from the true conversation that we all have to be having. You know, it, it's what happened to George Floyd was 100% horrible and, and, and very, very hard to take for any human being. I think, Corey, you hit that, you said that perfectly. But now, as a white male, to understand and, and drive a conversation of, of opportunity and equality has to happen. And my fear is, is the, the media narrative drives away all of the real true topics that we can have. And that's why I feel it's so important for us to, to look internal, to look at the church, to look at the high school, to look at you know, what we can do and, 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 and really have um, a true diversity conversation amongst our own peers. Don't look at the national piece, see what we can do here first because that's where it all begins. I appreciate you bringing in, you know, a ministry aspect and church and our high school and all that. And I want to then kick it over to Sean and Chagay, deeply involved in ministry with the school and the after school programs that you guys work with and the students and all that. So just to kind of wrap up on this, this topic and, you know, what's been going on, what have you been seeing with kids, how you guys have been doing in the last couple of weeks, why don't you share with your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so for myself, um, you know, I can say, I mean, I pretty much hopped off the roller coaster. Um, this, this has been one of the first times where, you know, I've been struck emotionally again to the level in which I have been. Um, and it's not so much because of one particular incident. Um, to have my daughter, uh, my, my two boys sit and watch what happened um, to see her tear up and try to ask the question why, um, and for me to figure out the answer, um, you know, it's tough. Um, it's tough because I found myself in a situation, you know what I mean, similar, it wasn't anything uh, that went wrong, but it was a negative situation that happened to me. Um, involvement in could have easily been myself, could have easily been one of my boys or any of the boys that I work with every single day. Uh, so from a from the standpoint of where I'm at right now, um, you know, I'm just figuring, 
I'm figuring out how to be able to continue to tolerate, you know? Um, so from a ministry perspective, um, it's been the word that continues to guide me in the path that I need to continue to prepare my children as a father. Um, I need to continue to prepare, prepare every young man that I work with at Kingdom Prep to be able to go out here and to continue to let their light shine despite all the circumstances that continues to happen. Um, the question is, at what point is enough enough um, as you continue to walk, not only personally, uh, but also within the ministry? Uh, man, it's, it's been difficult. Uh, as I watched the video and I watched a, a man struggle on the ground and call out for his mom. He's, you know, he's a taller guy, bigger guy. I'm a pretty big guy myself. Uh, I, I put myself in his shoes and I, and I asked myself, what if I felt like, you know, not to, at a rough day, I get off work and a cop approaches me, whether I did something right or not, I'm just frustrated. And a cop sees somebody my size, a black man who may or may not be a criminal and they get a little aggressive with me and I, I get a little aggressive back and at what point Am I the person on the ground saying I can't breathe? And I'm the person that my son and my daughter have to go to a funeral for, not knowing exactly what happened to daddy. And as I watch that video play out, you know, it, it, I think everybody up here will admit it was, it caused all of us to kind of have this emotional response. But then now you have to work with other young black men and, and black women every single day and you got to explain to them that even though they got all of these difficult things happening around them, that you can't be the wrong type of black, right? You can't, you can't be the black that commits crime. You got to be the one that's always respectful. You got to be the one to, to do this and do that. And, and, you know, in some moments, you can't make a mistake. And how difficult is that to have a conversation with a 10-year-old or 11-year-old or a 12-year-old about? And then they have to carry that and make sure that they don't get in trouble along the way. And these are, these are kids without fathers, kids who sometimes don't have mom or dad around, and we're asking them to have all of these stressors on their back. I think at, at times it was me and my brothers who had all of these stressors on our back, and we're expected to do things right most of the time to prevent ourselves from falling down that, that path, right? The path of a lot of our black youth has to come to, right, to the streets or to drugs or, or anything else. And you reflect on your own life and what could I do for my own children? But it's not just my own children, it's their friends. It's my nephews, it's my nieces, it's the kids who, who are around this city who don't have any guidance or are lost to, to an extent. And that hurts because a small little, not a small thing, a man lost his life and you, you look back at all of these things and how many different things they connect to that are that kind of causes chaos in our lives. And right now we got a whole host of young black and Hispanic men and women who are looking like, how do I make it out of this thing called life? Without the positive influences of God's word or adult male role models or you know people who they can't look up to. So my mind is shooting all over the place every single day figuring out what I can do on my platform, whatever platform I have, to continue to have these conversations, not only with black and white people, but let's get some of our other brothers and sisters in Christ who might not be black or white into these conversations, because you might be surprised the type of input that they're able to provide for, in context that they're able to provide to the conversation. So we, we have to keep moving forward and we have to bring these things to the forefront, or we're just gonna be in this, this cycle of depression for people who are feeling beat down by the system and people who aren't, aren't able to speak up or don't know what to say. But if we, just like with anything, the more and more experience we have with it, we're able to be more successful with it. Well, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who happens to be white, and, and he said one of the problems that he has in the conversation is we haven't defined terms. We haven't defined terms, and so we end up having conversations or talking about things, and we're not even hitting the same point because we're not defining white privilege. Uh, systematic racism, institutional racism, what it means to have, what, what is the path? And then we talk about path. What, what is Black Lives Matter? All these terms. And he was encouraging me as, as he knew I was going to be in conversations like this for some time to help try to define terms. But until you define terms, you really can't have a conversation. Um, and so 
Uh, that's one of the things about the conversation. Let's start from the same point. What are we talking about? And then let's not take something we're talking about and then broaden it to the, everybody and then lose the topic we're, that we're speaking on. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to focus in. And you can't solve, solve all the world's problems in one conversation. <laughs> so just pick one topic <laughs> and hit that and say, today we'll talk about poverty. Tomorrow, education. Next day, you know, fatherhood. Next day, systematic racism. Next day, white privilege. You know, but not all in one conversation. Because that's when your head starts to hurt and, and you go nowhere fast. <laughs> but it, it seems like it's hard at times, though, because all of them are so intertwined. You know what I mean? So you can't, it's almost like you can't talk about one without the other. Um, you know, for me, we go back and see everything that's going on with the protests, right? So we have the protests that are going on. Um, they're easily being defined as going from here to here. Uh, for me, um, I personally feel that the protests are providing the most hope at this point. Now, I say that because, um, one, because of folks being energized, folks within our community. When we talk about it being here and start, st starting here, are being energized and they're getting out on the lines and, and, and they're protesting about how they feel, which is something that they need to be on the front lines for. But it's even bigger than that because now you have, you know, brothers and sisters from, you know what I mean, black, white, yellow, green, purple, you know what I mean? All these folks who are all walking, hitting the streets together. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's creating, you know what I mean, more consciousness, um, awareness, and, 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 and more empathy as they continue to walk so that we can start to really address the issue. I don't think that the elephant in the room is still fully addressed, but I feel like it's a step in the right way. Now, we can, we can get upset because the protests are getting loud. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was disappointed because I went to Walgreens. I couldn't even get my medicine. My wife going to yell at me because I can't come home with my medicine uh, because Walgreens, they shut Walgreens down. But um, in the end, was I really upset? I wasn't, and it was just because I, f I, f I felt it. Like, I, I, under, I completely understand where it comes from, you know what I mean? And when you continually get backed into a corner, uh, you know, it, it's, it comes out. Now, I'm not happy about all the ways that it comes out sometimes, but I, I, stand, I stand with them as they continue to push it out. And the louder it gets, maybe more to fall on deaf ears or people who are, are listening or kind of listening so it can be heard and we can continue to try to walk together in this. Yeah. Part of the conversation for me with, with my white friends and brothers in Christ, I'm getting emails and texts from pastors in the Wisconsin Senate who are my brothers, who I love, who I went to school with for at least four years, some of them, maybe eight, asking me about the black-white conversation. And my wife is in a Bible study with some women and is really speaking to, to uh, the white women and, or white educators saying, be the bridge. And I, I went to her and I said, I, I don't need anybody to be the bridge for me. Just don't, just don't burn it down. <laughs> so, so when I talk about white friends, what, I'm, what I want to say is, be you. Show God's grace and love and kindness. And, and when someone is trying to achieve, whether they look like you're not, just continue to be kind and loving and gracious. It's, it's the parts of our nation's history where things have been, have been taken away, withheld from. Those are the things that, that cause this, this discomfort. Um, and, and I think that's what, what I would say to start a conversation. Yeah. And to, to add on to that, you know, Aaron, to help out to start the conversation. Um, just listen to their experience. Find out where they've been, what, what path they walked to get to where they're at. Because um, some people, and man, that social media is <laughs> something else, you know. <laughs> and I've seen, I, I put out a post and I just talked about some experiences that I had been through in my life. And a few people addressed it and they said, you know, I've known you since high school. I, I am so sorry. Let, let's get together. Let's talk. And then I've had the ones that are like, well, this is this and this is that. So they're now pushing their agenda or their issue or their concern onto me. And it's like, time out. Just listen. Mm. Because, like you say, we don't want to burn a bridge. we got to level the playing field and be together with everyone. And I don't mean to make it sound like you just got to run out and jump on someone like, hey, tell me your experiences, you know, something like that. <laughs>
I want to ask a, a question that maybe following up on some of these things, you know, when we're talking about kind of getting to the issue or the issues and there's multiple conversations. And just going back to a little bit ago with what Chakay was saying and about um, talking to his children and his family and his students, you know, the kids he works with, um, about how to act and behave. And I want to talk about or better ask about something that a lot of people say. So let's talk about like a police scenario and you talked a lot about George Floyd. You know, some people would say, well, if, let's say, black males, and there's a lot on the news recently, would just behave, if they would just um, not have a criminal record, if they would just, then it wouldn't be a problem. You know, if there wasn't so much black on black violence, then it wouldn't be an issue. Um, and and that kind of, I think, perhaps sidetracks what we should be talking about, but I just want to get a feedback from any one of you on what you think about that or, you know, what, what should I say to someone, because I'll admit I hear that more from white people than I do from black people, what should I say to someone who says, no, if, if they just obeyed the law and were respectful in the first place, then it would never be an issue with the police, you know, so response to that. Because I know we, it was important to use personal stories, and I, I can use a, a personal story from my own life. Uh, and I, I've shared this with, I think, other people before it was, I put some on. Well, either, either way, uh, when I was 16, uh, 17, it was me and some buddies. Uh, we were on like 64th and Silver Spring where my aunt lived. And we were parked going, I think, west. And a police car drove past us going east. And we ended up, you know, my brother ran in the house to grab something and one of the buddies in the back seat when the cop passed, it, it, it must have looked like he put something in, it, in his book bag or something. Uh, we're, we're all Wisco students, all four of us, Wisconsin Lutheran High School students. Uh, and I pull on to Silver Spring in Milwaukee and the cops, you know, we're, we're probably just drove off the house, uh, away from the house about 30 seconds later, the cops sw uh, kind of swooped down on us. And he comes to the car, I got my license, I'm driving my mom's car, yes sir, you know, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you mind stepping out the car? Now, I'm a 17 year old black man, and you trust me, I've heard stories, even if I haven't, haven't experienced it before, that this could go very wrong very fast. So I get out the car, I'm talking to him, being respectful. Another police car pulls up. I'm like, all right, this is a little weird, we didn't do nothing yet. So he asks my brother and our two friends to get out of the car. Now a paddy wagon pulls up. I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> what's, what's, what's going on here? You know what I'm saying? Hey, you mind if we search the car? I'm like, ain't, no, ain't nothing in there, officer, no drugs, nothing like that. No, you know, we, we all go to Wisconsin Lutheran High School. We're just trying to catch a basketball game. Oh, okay, we're gonna check the car. I'm like, you know, like I said, you're not gonna find something. You know, you're not gonna find anything. We don't really do that type of stuff. So they, they searched the car for like a good 30, 45 minutes, searching our backpacks, just destroying my mom's car, like inside and out, pulling everything. And, oh, we didn't find anything. I'm like. I told you you weren't going to find anything. You know what I mean? So I'm kind of upset you got two police cars plus this paddy wagon. And this is only, I don't know, 13 years ago when I experienced this. And like, I'm frustrated as I get back into the car because I'm, I'm on a road student at Wisco. Uh, we play, we, all of us are athletes. We don't do drugs. We don't drink. We don't do none of that stuff. And we just got treated like a common criminal. We didn't do nothing wrong. Now imagine, imagine if I had died or I had a highly publicized visit to the ER, how much national news it could have made. This types of stuff happen every day where black men and black women and other races possibly do something, everything right. And I still get treated like a criminal. There are no stats for that. I didn't report that. There are uh, hundreds and thousands of black people who don't go back and report those types of instances. And it's just like, that's how we get treated, baby. You know, that's how that's how African Americans, unfortunately, that's kind of how we have to deal with it. And you can point to the, you know, the police brutality lawsuits that end in death and say, oh, well, you know, point to different stats. But there are certain stats that don't tell the full picture. There is no measurement tool for a 17 year old who's harassed in his own neighborhood and don't know about it, how to set up a, you know, go back and report what these officers have done. And maybe they were just doing their job. But what was I just doing? Just visiting my aunt. And those stories happen way too much. And as a young black man, and, or a, you know, per, from my personal experience, that's kind of tough to deal with, man. That's something hard to shake. Especially, you know, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have encounters with the, 
the you know positive and negative ones for the rest of your life that those types of moments stick out in our hearts and it happens way too often yeah. I mean, you kind of i i grew up with this this um thing on my back that i heard too many times so many times you got to work twice as hard to be considered who knows the rest of it half as good so now think about that as a young man growing up and and you're growing up in a church where you hear everybody is created by the almighty god and and there is uh, no one that is any better in god's sight but in the world you live in you've got to work twice as hard to to not have that happen to to avoid the, the police officers or avoid those situations that that could be neutral that might end up bad and and it's it's a heavy burden. So talking about the boys that you minister to, whether they be at Wisco, at Kingdom Prep, or at Lighthouse, they're they're carrying that same kind of baggage, and that's and that's hard. And then people wonder why, when when a moment when when a stress breaker happens, people snap in a way that seems out of control. There has been something that's been been held down for for years that finally just appears and and it's not not right like you were saying before about the protests you, you don't agree with how sometimes it, it shows itself but you can understand where the frustration comes from or the anger or or even the the mistrust you know and it's and it's unfortunate because i i know cops i i I've, my best friend from grade school Corey jenkins love you bro detective in mississippi doing a great job down the block, Marlon Davis, former detective here in Milwaukee, did a wonderful job. I, and I trust them with my life. And I know there are other police officers that, that do just to get a job, but when you grew up in a community where you're afraid that an incident might go bad just because of the color of your skin, it, it makes it hard. Um, so, yeah. Andy, go ahead. It just reminds, Chucky, listening to you kind of give that story, kind of reminded of me of the stereotypical nature continues. I mean, probably would be a surprise, but back in 1987, we got pulled over and uh, best friend is black. We're driving his dad's car, which happens to be a new Porsche. Um, so you have a black man driving a new Porsche. <laughs> and... Um, Maybe we're exceeding the speed limit a little bit, but that, that wasn't the point. <laughs> but, 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 but that wasn't that wasn't the point. The point, the really, the, the story really was is not just getting pulled over. It was the fact that a second police car and a third police car came to check out the situation because it was, you know, you take the stereotypical situation, and 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 you had that, and that was a long time ago. So that that type of situation was. You know, I can, you can, I can't, I can understand it. I can't relate to it, but I can understand it. And that's the part that I think is, is the most challenging because now it's just exemplified nowadays in the, in the fact that we're looking at it and going, now a situation is just, you, you look at the stereotypical and say, well, this is what it must be because this is what I think it looks like. And they can't take it at face value anymore. Hmm. And um, just to kind of further that along where my fears come in is, you know, my son-in-law is black, and he's a police officer. Newly married, they'll have their, their first wedding anniversary coming up. So where do I go with that? How do I understand that? How do you support that? So it's it's a challenge each day. That's why I keep going back to where where's the base point for everything. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to, to uh, the question that was asked earlier, just to piggyback on what was said. I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that transparency. Um, and what's going on in your life um, as well. I just think when it comes to the conversation, when we're asking about why black on black crime, you know what I mean, if you just obey the law, um, I think it's a couple points to that. One, I feel like it's a deflection. Um, I think it's a deflection from the real issue um, that's always going on. I think if we take a look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a stats man. I was a finance guy, but I, I'm not a stats guy. Those are two different worlds, my people. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you're looking at it, I think it's like, what, 90% of the, the crimes that happen against black folks is about from another black person. Um, but oddly enough, um, for white people, um, we're looking at, what, 80-some percent, 83, 85? 
So we're talking about nine out of 10 versus eight out of 10. So we wanna have the conversation. I'm sure we can have the same type of conversation if we're talking about our Brown brothers as well. But typically those, these crimes happen with the people you are simulated with, right? You're always around these certain groups all the time. You know what I mean? It's, it's gonna happen. Um, I'm not saying that it's okay, but I think there's a much larger conversation to have versus just pinpointing why it just consistently continues to happen with black folks. So that's why I think it's, it, it deters us away from uh, what the true issue is. And if we want to talk about things like black on black crime, uh, me being far from a historian, uh, don't ask any Wisco teachers about that, but um, we have to take a step back and look at all the systematic pieces that have placed us in a lot of the situations that we're in. I'm down for anybody who asked that question to talk, I'm, I'm down to have a conversation about housing. Um, and how housing was spent. I'm down to have a conversation about um, schooling and the breakdown of our public school system in order to integrate so that black kids had to leave their community schools and go out to the suburbs and uh, white schools got paid for kids to come out so that they did not have to come into the city. Um, I'm down to have a conversation in regards to this um, just about, I mean, the laws and policies that have been put in place um, you know what I mean? A lot, of, a lot of times I think folks think that black people ask for this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I didn't ask to be born on 25th of Hampton. My, my grandparents came up, uh, migrated up from Mississippi because of how bad the conditions were um, to create more space and more opportunity for their brothers and sisters. When you got six, seven, eight brothers and sisters on each side, how do you provide more opportunity? Well, you come to the north and you, you try to break it out from there. My grandmother will tell you to this day when I came here, 25th of Hampton, I thought we were in the suburbs. And then what happens as soon as you start to get, you know, a little bit of integration and you have white flight that happens, um, you have redlining that started to happen, folks ended up in certain spaces. There's all these variables that go on, which I would like to have a larger conversation about, which we can't deny, which brings some of the issues. Now, people make their own decisions, but uh, man, I'm talking about the chains are broken, but like mentally, a lot of those chains are still on because of all of the trauma that happens. And if we don't see racism as a mental health issue, and if we don't start seeing a lot of these issues and the trauma that it's caused people, generation over generation, it's hard to really dig deep and have real dialogue about, well, why black people keep killing black people? Like, I, I mean, we, I, I, know, I know folks in the community who work hard at this every single day. They got folks, you got folks like Reggie Moore, you got folks like, Jamal Smith, you got folks like Dr. Ramel Smith, all these folks, uh, Muhib Dyer, all these folks in the community trying to make sure that we stand on and make it better for our kids to grow up in. So the fight is happening every single day, but I just think we just need to take a step back at the questions we're asking and make sure they're not biases. If I just go off that a little bit and just say, no one is saying that in the black community we don't have room personally and ourselves to improve. No one's saying that in the question or conversation. It's just saying that there are forces outside of our control that, that are, are, are stopping some of the growth that we would love to see. So don't think that in our homes or in the, in the families, in the communities, that we're not saying about each individual, do your best, try your best, stay out of trouble. We're, we're having those conversations daily. It's the, the ones that, we, that we're not having with the policymakers and, and the, the institutions and our, our, our white brothers and sisters that we, we want to have now. So, Let's not switch the conversation. Yeah. Um, both can be true. And I think where the real change begins to happen with the kids, with our kids, um, and the, the students that we serve every single day, is that, you know, I like, I, I, I want you to be able to make a difference. You know, you're going to have some who are going to be on the front lines in the streets, who are going to be, you know what I mean, making sure that people have a voice. Um, and also, there are going to be folks getting a seat at the table. I need you to become that police officer that goes around and polices your community, right? It's, it's tough when you have folks who don't, who aren't from the community who police our communities. That only happens pretty much with black people. You know what I mean? And, and, it, and it's not at any fault of white folks at all, but I mean, it's, it's just a different lens and perspective from what you see things from. Um, and that's a tough pill to digest at times. Um, so, you know, I got, I, this brother made me forget everything else I was gonna say. But, <laughs> um, it's, for me, it's, it's important, I think. Uh, like, I think you mentioned like bringing more Af uh, African-Americans back into community police, their own neighborhood. I know that was just an example yeah, that's of what right. it was communicated. Right. But uh, 
making sure that we're being culturally aware and culturally accepting, even as black people, because sometimes we can be our own harshest critics, Man. right? We we come, we get a seat at the table and automatically we forget about everything else, right? We we teach in our- You see Candace Owens. Huh? You see Candace uh -huh. Owens talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important that we, we don't forget kind of who we are That's while it. we're part of the process. Like, uh, I know it's hard for me, like when I first got back, uh, from school, I come back working in the city and I'm like, okay, I got to do things this way. <laughs> and I just forget, ignore everything that I was as a kid, as an African-American kid. And remembering that as I talk to them and build relationships with them and, you know, teach them about discipline and self-discipline and self-motivation. Just keeping all of these little aspects in the back of my head as I teach other young men and young women kind of, you know, where I, where I made it at. So. Right. And then, so I got a, a public service announcement uh -huh. for Martin Luther College. We could use more African-American pastors and teachers in our church body. And so we love to have you enroll at Martin Luther College, so you can be where you grew up, and you can make a change in our schools that are starving for teachers who look just like them. Mm. That's been a, a statement of Paris since I was in grade school in the 80s. Why don't we have more black teachers? And the answer sometimes is we haven't sent more black students to the college that trains our teachers, or we've been afraid to call teachers who are black from other colleges. So we can do a better job of, at that point, just getting back in the community with her. And they know that, but it's really tough to come to New Orleans, man. Oh, oh, I, 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 I did. I, did I would just be honest can, with can you. I, like, you know, like I know. Brothers from New Orleans, I careful guys. I grew up in New Orleans. Twenty-five years in New Orleans. Twenty-five. Right, count them. Right. Twenty-five. You're right. You're right. You're right. But it's, it's, it's what you make of the opportunity. I mean, when you look at brothers like this who sit up here, you can see the impact you can have, you know what I mean, being able to be, put yourself into, you know, a variety of different environments and being able to succeed. And I think that's why God has called us back to these spaces right here. Like, when we look at the plan for me to start in my untraditional route that I was on and for us to come back full circle and we, for us to be in this space um, right now, um, you know, God's, God's plan is the greatest, man. You know what I mean? And sometimes we lean on our own understanding too much and follow our own plans because we want to make all this money or we're one of the ones to make it up out of the hood, so I want to make this money. But, like, what is it really about? You know what I mean? Like, what is it really about? We spent the other night by the fire. What, what is this really about? You know what I mean? So, but what it's really about is coming back and making a true impact in our communities, and that's the mentality we have set. That's why, that's why I left everything that, you know, I was doing in the past to be at Kingdom Prep. What better way to serve young men in our city and help them to be able to understand that God's purpose for them. So that's our role um, as men. It's our role as, as, as parents, um, as fathers, um, and to help our, our kids to be able to do it together. I think we should come back to that fathers and, and um, parents thing in just a second, but I want to piggyback off of this and kick it over to Andy and Aaron and just ask Aaron as a white male working in a predominantly black school and, and community, you know, what do you see? What do you experience? Uh, your children and, and Andy, whichever of you first, you know, for your children, all four great kids that go here to Wisco, but a very diverse school, you know, what is that experience like coming from white family? So my experience at Garden Home has been, been dynamite. Before I get to that though, when uh, Mr. Spear was talking about getting some more people that look like you policing our our neighborhoods. The first thing that popped in my head was at Garden Homes we could use probably some more of our kids from the neighborhood becoming teachers. And I know you oh. went on your tangent on that, but my first years at Garden Homes were tough. I was young and naive and anybody and everybody was going to say anything, but it seems like the longer you stay in a place, the more they trust you. And I could say, I don't know, after about 10 years of being there, I had people that would trust me and still maybe not agree with what I do, but at least have a conversation with me about it rather than tell me, you don't know what you're doing, you're not from <laughs> Milwaukee. Um, and I've had opportunities to leave garden homes, but I, I had no reason to leave garden homes. It's, it's my passion. Um, I think the kids there, because I teach a younger grade, I teach fourth grade, I think some of the kids there look to you as a father figure, which is, is, is very meaningful uh, to me to be able to say, hey, I'm here for you if you need anything, or you need a hug, you need to talk to me in private. It's one of the things I always say, because then a lot of times they don't want to say stuff in front of their friends, um, but they'll talk to you in private and then 
You can just be there to guide them according to God's word and give them to the best advice. And I believe they trust me, even though maybe I did not have the same situations um, or experiences they have, which I think I could minister a lot better if I would have had those same experiences. And that's why we need people that have come from our grade schools and come from Wisco to go on to MLC and then to come back to our city to join us and make a difference. You know, and we always teach you, okay, we're just so happy that he's back at Garden Homes leading our youth center because, you know, I knew him when he was in grade school. <laughs> <laughs> and and I would love to be able to have more of the kids that, that you taught or that you, that you worked with, that you loved, that you that you, you know, played sports with to come back and and then build our community. I guess for my for myself, um, I'm just so thankful that that um, all of my kids got to go here to Wisco and be in such a diverse uh, high school. I, I think, especially now in the situations that everything is, they can really look at things with wide open eyes, and they can see see what's out in front of them. It's not scary to them. It's not unknown to them. And they can, un and they can understand, be first of all, because they're centered in Christ. That's the, that's, the main, that's the main thing. But then to have the experiences and the friendships that they had acro across the board, I think, are very, very meaningful uh, across the board. And that's been very good. I always said, you know, growing up, I grew up at St. Jacoby, had a chance to play all the different, you know, from, from Garden Homes to Atonement to Saloa. At a young age, you grew up and did that, so you never had that view viewpoint of like, well, that they're different, or or somebody's different because of their skin color. You just you simulated as a young age that this is just another person, your peer of, of your age. And like I said, now to have the diversity of the of the high school is just, just so meaningful. And I have to say, um, uh, for you, Chuck A, I mean. I, when I saw your name was on the panel, I oh, you don't know me, but I know you because I've, <laughs> I've followed you since I knew you were here at, at Wisco because I was bringing my kids who were really young watching you play and seeing your advancement uh, through school through and, and through the Lighthouse and everything that you've done there. I can't thank you enough. And, and like I said, if we can have more and more of you out there, that, that's where it makes the difference. That's where it goes back to what I said originally. How do we begin here? So um, I commend for you for everything that you've done. Thank you. So as being fathers and men dealing with a lot of, of black kids, what do you, how do you navigate in this situation or in this space? Like how are you dealing with your feelings, looking and saying like, man, my son or daughter has to deal with this or experience this. What lessons or what things are you trying to teach them through these times? I don't mean to dominate, but <clears throat> I, I just think it's important. I think one of the biggest things, one, uh, my, my role as a, as a father, um, and even in my role over at Kingdom Prep, is to unconditionally love, um, is to protect, um, and is to educate, right? Um, so I think within that, just constantly letting them know not only about my love, about, about mom's love, and how much they're valued and understood, but f f Christ's love, you know what I mean? Um, that they continue to be filled with, and that can fill their hearts every single day. I think that the other piece is not to sugarcoat. Um, I talk to them about the realities of what really exists. Um, but I think the most important thing, which this can be even for the, not, not these adults, but for adults in general, um, is that you have to learn how to be able to decipher, right? Um, there are folks who just don't know and don't get it. Uh, and there are folks who get it and just don't care. And I think being able to take time to be able to understand who you're dealing with and the moments in which you may have an escalated situation or you're trying to understand a perspective or a lens, always take a step back and be able to see that lens. Like, is this an, a situation where, like, it's, it's true ignorance or, like, do they really just not know? Some folks just really do not know. If you're in a situation, there are some folks who have never been discriminated against, who have never been profiled, who have never been stereotyped. As crazy as that sounds to me, like it's hard for them to understand the thoughts that I have, the perception that I have, and the things that I've gone through in my life. You know what I mean? So without being able to break those down and, and, and at least start to break those away so you can maybe there is someone that you can sit and you can educate. Um, you know, and, and, and my son, one of my oldest son has had to go through a situation with that. Like, this isn't a situation where you just sit back and start calling somebody racist. You sit back, understand their perspective, and you give a breakdown to them. Um, the thing that you learn about, particularly in high school, 
is that most of everything that they have are learned tendencies. I mean, it's all the way throughout. Um, kind of go back, you know, you'll, you'll be hugging with somebody who doesn't look anything like you, and by the time you're older, um, you know, you, you'll be hearing some things you never thought you would hear from that person. So, but you can help to make an impact on that person through your words and through your actions as well. So, it's not to constantly just tolerate, but it's to understand as much as you want for them to understand you. From my perspective, um, father in a household, I've always, especially as my my boys and my daughter have gotten older, um, it's always I've been under the the concept that we're in a mission field, you know, and I want my kids to understand what exactly that means, where they're out there and they're they're able to talk to anybody of any race, any age, and have a meaningful conversation with them. Um, I also try to, with my wife, we implore our kids to better themselves, keep to educate themselves on everything, on both sides. And uh, my kids understand, you know, we're a mixed race family. They understand the, um, the mixture of my wife and her Germanness and all that stuff. And then they also understand, <laughs> hey, uh, we're from Tennessee too. So they, they get that. So they can sit down and have some greens and some German potato salad at the same time. Um, <laughs> But, <laughs> um, so my point to that, as a father, I, I definitely want to build that foundation with my children so that that time comes and I can see as a, you know, God willing, I'm a grandfather, I can see that they've done that as well. And, and I'm seeing it, I hear it. You know, my, my oldest son, he's in, he's in the Word. He, he reads his devotion, he spends some time with a, uh, Pastor Hebner on every week, <laughs> and, uh, and I think he's doing a great job. And we have such an eclectic group of young men and young women that come to our house, and I'm just known as Papa T to them. They don't, they don't see a black guy or a white guy over there. They just see a father figure, and that's a blessing. That makes my heart just feel great. Now, we'll see what happens when my daughter gets here, you know, the <laughs> The young men coming over to the house might be a different situation. I might need a couple of. So no, for well, fatherhood, uh, parenting, my wife and I do this thing together, and, and so one of the things we've always done with our, our children is just be honest, honest about what we're feeling, honest about, honest about what's going on, honest about who God is, uh, and, and so that they are part of that mission field and they can speak to the things that they see honestly. And, and then always being in the Word. As, as a pastor, I, I got it easy. I, I've got to be in the Word. My kids got to go to church. So they, they get the Word, and they, they get a good dose of it, and they are um, very, very supportive of my ministry. But now they're seeing it's their ministry too, and, and so that's kind of a cool thing for them. But then I want to expand a little bit for fatherhood and just say uh, I, I love my father. Um, cried last month on Father's Day. Because I missed them. But there are other men in my life who were fathers that, that, that I didn't share any blood with. But there was a coach named Mr. Walker at Beckham Stapleton Little League. He was old when he was coaching me. <laughs> Man, he gave his heart to his boys. There were coaches at prep, uh, Coach Bertolas. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 on Father's Day, I sent him a message. Happy Father's Day. There, there, so, so I'm trying to be not just a father to my children, which, which – is, is my first calling, right? But, but to, to any child that's in the world that I happen to be able to touch, let me be that, that, that to them too. I, I can't be Papa T, but I, I can be me <laughs> in that moment and say, how could I show you a, a better way, whether it's a, a young white child that has never met a black man before in his life and doesn't know how to respond to me because it's like, I heard some words in my house, I probably shouldn't use them, but how, how should I refer to you? And we can have that conversation. Um, or it's young black boys or black girls or that, that are saying, you know, the only, only vision I have of the father was, was him leaving. I didn't see anything positive. And show them the positive of, of a black male in the house being a father. So I, I, I kept expanding my fatherhood role, I think, to whomever uh, is, is younger than me that's willing to listen, that will be in my, my, my sphere of influence. How could I impact them positively just as the father has me? One of the things we do at our house, uh, 
as as a father, and, and of course my wife joins me in parenting our kids, but it seems like when they have issues, it's always, does God give you the right to feel this way? And that was something that Pastor Maddock had taught us a bunch of years back at Garden Homes. It was a question that really stuck with me. Do you have the right, according to God's word, to feel this way? And then we follow it up with, uh, can you find a passage that would go behind that? And a lot of times that will de-escalate. A lot, of, a lot of our issues are family issues, you know, <laughs> brothers arguing or whatever. But does God give you the right to feel that way? And can you back it up with a passage? And so I think as a father, as many times as I can point the kids back to the word, back to the word, back to the word, don't do it because I said it, do it because God said it. It's in God's word. And if we raise our kids according to God's word, I think it doesn't really matter what our skin color is. If we always go back to God's word. We got the wonderful opportunity to teach our kids, hey, this is what God's word says. That's how we live our lives. And with that being said, we're still sinful. And there's going to be sin in the world. And we're still going to have problems. But as many times as we can, point them back to God's word so that they have the, hey, this is what God wants us to do in this situation. Um, this is what, what I would say about fatherhood. Andy, I wanted to ask you something because you brought up a point that growing up you played against the Atonements, the Salolas, the Garden Homes, which are predominantly black. And sometimes I hear white people say, I don't see color. And I think that's a complete lie. Like, we all see color. So when I look at that and say we don't see color or we do see color, what, what did you do to make sure that you didn't become prejudiced or what do you teach your kids about that? Because I know we all see color in some way, but it doesn't affect us. So what do you do or what, what do you think your experiences were to keep you from becoming different? Well, that's a great question. Thanks for just popping up. And just <laughs> uh, trying to reel back my 50 years and everything. No, it, it, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a great po that's a great point. I, I think where it started with me, at, because it was at such a young age, first of all, that do you see color? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, the, the, they look, they look differently. You can't say, well, I don't see it. You absolutely do see it. But it's how do you, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? And how do you relate to it? And what are you looking for? And I believe it, it is so much about understanding the person and the character of the person is what really rang true to me. Um, and, and that's what got me past seeing the differences and understanding where are your common, common, common pieces, I guess it would be. And that, to me, now falling into fatherhood, is lead by example. How do you lead by example? The words that you use, the, the company that you keep, you know, you can't say one thing and do the, and do the other. Um, but to me, I just go, I look back at those, at, at the days of being young like that and playing against, and it just was, it was a challenge against somebody different but at the same time recognizing who they are. And, and um, that, I think that's what mattered to me the most. I don't know if I answered your question completely, but it was it, it really what it, what, it, what it comes down to. Let's go to a, one last question, just kind of wrap it up. We don't have to talk too long about this, not because it's unimportant, but uh, one last thought to think about. What's, what's the role of faith and Christ and the church when we're talking discussions on race? Well, I'm going to step up and say the, the church has to uh, take a long, hard look at itself. Uh, historically, the church has not represented God great in regard to race relations. And I'll say, let's say with regard to ethnic clashes, um, because um, if you look at history, you'd say it's, there's some shameful things. And, and first, as a church, not that we have to go back and rewrite history and redo history, but we've got to recognize that um, we have things that are within the Christian church that aren't biblical and that 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 hurts ministry across cultures because it looks like there's a separation and a, and a division that um well it is that causes harm and so i have advocated on another platform i'll advocate again first i would say let's get white get rid of the white jesus pictures in our churches we know historically that that wasn't the case and so that shows that we're not going to do it uh, according to the Bible, not according to our own feelings or thoughts or tradition. You do that, and, and, and then you are more, uh, I don't want to say accepting, that word gets misunderstood. 
that, that when someone from outside of your church culture comes in to worship, you allow them space to learn and to grow and not just assume that it's, it's wrong because it's not your way. Uh, and so that, there are a lot of things we can do that way. But with regard to, to church itself and faith in, individually, um, I try to see everybody as a creation of God. And God created us all. That our first parents were Adam and Eve, and so we are, in essence, brothers and sisters, regardless of how much you look like me or not. Because we have one God, and we have, we have two original parents. And that my God loved me enough and everybody else in this world enough to, to send his son to die for me. Uh, whether I am racially sensitive or insensitive, whether I have hate in my heart or anger or mistrust, whether I have done wrong or haven't done as much wrong, Christ died for all of that. And so faith for me plays a huge part in being able to say to my, my brother who is struggling right now with, with, with this, who is white, and say, I'm willing to be patient with your struggle because we can have the conversation because God forgives us both. And, and I can talk to my brother who's black and who's scared and say, you can have the conversation because God who loves us both gives us strength and encouragement. And so it goes back to that we all have one God who loves us and, and to rely on his love, that forgiveness, and, and trusting in him, um, that's, that's where I'm at. Can I go? Not sure. I, I wasn't saying it like that. I was just, you know, He's doing you know, a sermon. <laughs> let him, let him uh, finish his sermon. <laughs> uh, for me, self-reflection is key. Uh, through everything with this, uh, where our country is right now, I look back at my own biasness uh, towards uh, a lot of different people, right? Uh, how I feel about women, you know, at times how I feel about uh, homosexuals. And as we look back at the self-reflection in ourselves, as a church, we have to self-reflect on where our biases are and how we treat other people and how we treat other races and how we treat other groups. Because uh, we as Christians, we're expected to do that very often, right? To constantly reevaluate what's going on in our soul, what's going on in our spirit, what's going on in our hearts. So we as a church body should do that too. We should constantly be reevaluating and self-reflecting on what are we, what are we doing to reach uh, the word of Christ to as many people as possible. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an easy thing, uh, but as we look at everything that Jesus had done for us, his sacrifice, it should be a little bit easier because <laughs> we're looking at God's word. Uh, so we have to constantly be reevaluating what we're doing to, to share the word of Jesus Christ. Uh, see, everybody is on this, this spectrum of spiritual uh, maturity, right? Everybody's somewhere on this spectrum, no matter if you're on the far end. On the, we're still on this, the end of spiritual maturity. And no matter where we're at on that line, we're kind of all sinners. We're all sinners. We are all undeserving of God's grace. We are all undeserving of God's mercy. It doesn't matter where you're at on this spectrum. There's only one Savior. Even if you come into the hood, even if you, you know, as a white man or a black man, you're not the Savior. You know, you're not the Savior to come in here and do this. There's only one Savior. And thank goodness he died 2,000 years ago for us because if it was up to me to save these black kids that I'm serving, we would all be in hell. You know what I mean? So just constantly re reflecting that there's one Savior, there's one person who died for us. It's not me. It's the same person I believe in. So, I think that's well said. I think, Chuck, you, you summed it up well. I mean, we have to say, know who the Savior is. I think also at this time, the church is being attacked also in many, many different fashions. And, and so if, if people are trying to find comfort in the church, how do we make sure that that is a mainstay that people they can go to, have open conversations, but recognize in God's eyes, we're all, we, you know, we're all the same. We're all the same, and how, and how can we utilize that? Because that has to bring a sense of comfort, not a sense of challenge. I just don't know what, what, what greater uh, person to follow if you want to talk about love, peace, and justice than Christ himself. Um, when you look at the, uh, the eclectic groups that he moved around with, if you look at his, I constantly look at his disciples, and you know what I mean? You're talking about somebody who's picking folks that not like, not within his circle, uh, and moving with and getting to know uh, the person who left the circles of comfort in order to be able to minister um, and to be able to include um, those unlike who he may see every single day. 
uh, there's no greater example. Um, so to continue to love Christ up, not so that you just constantly in our hearts, but how he lives and how he lived every single day. Um, I mean, he defines love, uh, peace and justice for me. And I want for the kids that we work with every single day and the people who are around us to know that. Well, I just want to say to the whole panel and, and on behalf of CL how thankful we are for you guys to be here. I know personally, I just respect all of you men so much and you mean so much to me for who you are and what you do and how you serve and whom you serve. And I'm just so thankful for the conversation that we had today and what you shared and the open conversation that, that we had here. And I just want to say to all the people who are watching, I guess first to the world and to America, I, am, I implore, I beg you, that if we can only have conversations like this, if we can only be loving and kind and listen in the way that, that these men exemplified tonight, so much more would change one person at a time. And specifically to the Christian church and specifically to Christian men, I implore you, I beg you, to follow the example of these men tonight who just are great men of God, who are in the word, who are leaders, who love each other and share the love of Christ with others. So much can be changed and so much in the world can be different if we show this kind of love. And so thank you once again for being here and thank you for watching.